of a quorum because I see the distinguished senator from Wyoming ready to uh, take the floor. Madam President. The senator from Wyoming. Thank you, Madam President. It is disappointing that the Supreme Court has upheld the constitutionality of the new health care law. Just because it's constitutional doesn't mean it's the best policy perfect policy or even good policy. And just because the court upheld the law does not change the fact that the American people have overwhelming concerns about it. Not all of it, but a lot of it. In fact, the court affirmed that the new health care law is a massive tax increase on the American people. Congress must get serious about fixing our broken health care system. We can start by changing this misguided health care law that has divided the American people and failed to address rising health care costs. Congress should work together to make common sense step-by-step -step health reforms that can truly lower the cost of health care. I was pleased to see that the Supreme Court narrowed the Medicaid expansion because states can't afford them. Hardworking Americans are still struggling in this anemic economy and need real action to make health care more affordable. Reforms do not have to start here in Washington. Our nation's states are laboratories of democracy and can play a significant role in addressing the health care crisis in America. Governors are in a special position to understand the unique problems facing their states and fixing health care. Like most problems facing our nation, they cannot be a one-size-fits-all solution. Efforts underway by Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels provide a great example of what different states are working on. He's moving forward with Healthy Indiana Initiative, which is an affordable insurance program for uninsured state adults aged 19 to 64. Outside Washington, some health insurance companies have already stated that they will adopt several reasonable provisions to lower health care costs. These include allowing young adults to be covered until age 26 while on the parents' plan, not, not charging patients co-pays for certain care, not imposing lifetime limits, and not implementing retroactive cancellation of health care coverage. And they said they would do that regardless of how the Supreme Court case came out. One of the most effective ways Congress can address the rising costs of health care is to focus on the way it's delivered as part of the nation's current cost-driven and ineffective patient care system. America's broken fee-for-service structure is driving our nation's health care system further downward and tackling this issue is a good start to reining in the rising health care costs. What is fee-for-service? This method of payment encourages providers to see as many patients and prescribe as many treatments as possible, but does nothing to reward providers who help keep patients healthy. These misaligned incentives drive up costs and hurt patient care. The new health care law championed by President Obama and congressional Democrats did very little to address these problems. The legislation instead relied on a massive expansion of unsustainable government price controls found in that fee-for-service program, especially in Medicare. If we want to address the threat posed by out-of-control entitlement spending, we need to restructure Medicare to better align incentives for providers and beneficiaries. This will not only lower health care costs, it will also improve the quality of care for millions of Americans. In the health care bill, we took half a trillion dollars, $500 billion, out of Medicare and put it into new programs. And then we appointed an unelected board to suggest cuts that can be made. And the only place we left for cuts are providers, hospitals, um, home health care, nursing homes, and hospice. I don't think that's where we want to be cutting Medicare. Shifting the health care delivery system from one that pays and delivers services based on volume to one that pays and delivers services based on value is an idea that, re that unites both Republicans and Democrats. We've been mentioning a number of simple steps that can be taken while Congress weighs the larger fixes needed for Medicare. We can encourage insurers to offer plans that focus on delivering health care services by reducing co-pays for high-value services and increasing co-pays for low-value or excessive services. Consumer-directed health plans provide another avenue for linking financial and delivery system incentives. 
and have the potential to reduce health care spending by $57 billion a year. Bundled payments will support more efficient and integrated care. All these options have already been utilized by a number of private sector firms with great success. The federal government should be willing to support viable reforms where it's needed, but also refrain from handcuffing innovative private sector designs with excessive regulations or narrow political interests. <clears throat> Our nation has made great strides in improving the quality of life for all Americans, and we re need to remember that every major legislative initiative that's helped transform our country was forged in the spirit of compromise and cooperation. These qualities are essential to the success and longevity of crucial programs such as Medicare and Medicaid. But when it comes to health care decisions being made in Washington lately, the only thing the government is doing is increasing partisanship and legislative gridlock. <clears throat> I'd like to leave the Senate with some words of wisdom from one of our departed members, and that's Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a Democrat from New York who served in this body. He said in 2001, shortly before he retired, never pass major legislation that affects most Americans without real bipartisan support. It opens the door to all kinds of political trouble. Senator Moynihan correctly noted that the party that didn't vote for it will criticize the resulting program whenever things go wrong. More importantly, he predicted the measure's very legitimacy will be constantly questioned by a large segment of the population who will never accept it unless it's shown to be a huge success. That's a quote from Daniel Patrick Moynihan, former senator. Truer words were never spoken. <clears throat> We've seen each of these scenarios play out over the past two years as the new health care law polarized the nation. I hope this distinguished body has the courage to learn from our mistakes because our nation needs health care reform. But it has to be done the right way. Providing Americans with access to high quality, affordable health care is something I'm confident Democrats and Republicans should be able to agree on. But two and a half years ago, a Democrat president teamed up with a Democrat led Congress with only Democrat votes to force a piece of legislation on the American people that they never asked for and it's turned out to be just as disastrous as predicted. How so? A mid-economic recession, a spiraling federal debt, and accelerating increases in government health spending, they proposed a bill that's made the problems worse. Americans were promised lower health care costs. They're going up. Americans were promised lower premiums. They're going up. Most Americans were promised their taxes wouldn't change. They're going up. Seniors were promised Medicare would be protected. It was rated to pay for the new entitlement instead. Americans were promised it would create jobs. The CBO predicts that it will lead to nearly one million fewer jobs. Americans were promised they could keep their plan if they liked it. Yet millions have learned that they can't. And the President of the United States himself promised up and down that this bill was not a tax. That was one of the Democrats' top selling points because they knew it would never get passed if they said it was a tax. The Supreme Court spoke today. It said it's a tax. This law was sold to American people so on a deception, but it's not just that the promises about the law weren't kept, it's that it made the problem that it was meant to solve even worse. The supposed cure was proved to be worse than the disease. So it's not just that the promises about the law weren't kept, it's that it has made the problems it was meant to solve even worse. The supposed cure has proved to be worse than the disease. Now we do pass plenty of terrible laws around here that the court finds constitutional. We need to do some common sense step-by-step -step reforms that protect Americans' access to the care they need from the doctor they choose and at a lower cost. And that's precisely what I'm committed to doing. The American people weren't waiting on the Supreme Court to tell them whether they supported this law. That question was settled two and a half years ago. The more the American people have learned about this law, the less they've liked it. So now that the court has ruled, it's time to move beyond the constitutional debate and focus on the primary flaws because this colossal damage that it's doing and has already done to the health care system and to the economy and to the job market needs to be turned around.
there are things that need to be done and can be done. I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
consent that the quorum call be suspended? Without objection. And consent to speak in morning business? Without objection. Madam President, I can't remember another day when so many Americans were waiting for the Supreme Court to rule. But today was one of those days all across America. Everyone understood that a decision just across that street by nine members of the Supreme Court was historic and politically significant. This morning, the Supreme Court handed down this decision, 193 pages with all of the major uh, opinions and dissenting and concurring opinions included in the National Federation of Independent Business versus Sibelius. We all knew that this was the case to decide the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act, of course, was President Obama's, one of his first major legislative undertakings when he was elected president. Many of us who were part of the Senate and House during this debate will never forget it. I've been lucky enough to represent my great state of Illinois for quite some time in the House and Senate, but there's never been a more historic and um, exhausting debate than the one that preceded the final vote on the Affordable Care Act. The last vote in the Senate occurred literally on Christmas Eve, and we hurried away from here to be with our families, uh, knowing that uh, we had done something of great historic import. Behind this decision was a human experience that most every one of us has had at one time or another. I can recall in my own family experience that moment when I was a brand new dad uh, and a law student, not exactly a great combination in planning, but that was my life, and our daughter was born with a serious problem. We were here in Washington, D.C., and we were uninsured. No health insurance, brand new baby, and I'm a law student, and I can remember leaving Georgetown Law School, just a few blocks away from here, to go over to Children's Memorial Hospital to sit in a room with all of the other parents who had no health insurance. It was a humbling experience, waiting for your number to be called for a brand new doctor that you'd never seen before to sit down and ask you again for the hundredth time the history of your child. You never feel more helpless as a parent in that circumstance to have no health insurance and to hope, just to pray, that you're still doing the best for your child. <clears throat> that experience is, uh, is one that literally millions of Americans have every single day with no health insurance, praying that they'll get through the day without an accident, a diagnosis, or something that's going to uh, require medical care. What we tried to do with the Affordable Care Act was twofold. First, to expand the reach of health insurance coverage to more families. And second, to make health insurance itself more affordable and more reasonable. Let me start with this question of affordable and reasonable health insurance. Like my family, many families had children with a problem, a baby born with asthma, diabetes, cancer, heart issues. These are children which need special care, and many times families, when they turn and ask for health insurance, were turned away. Well, that's not fair, and it's not what we need in America. We need health insurance to protect those families, and that's one of the major provisions in the Affordable Care Act. Secondly, many people don't realize until it's too late that their old health insurance policies had lifetime limits. There was only so much money the health insurance company would pay. And people got into challenging medical situations with expensive health care needed, only to learn in the midst of their chemotherapy, their health insurance was all in, finished, walked away. We changed that in affordable health care. We eliminated the lifetime limits on health insurance policies for that very reason. We also said that the health insurance companies should be entitled to a profit and, of course, should charge a premium to cover the cost of their administration of health care. But we started drawing limits to what they could ask. Eighty-five percent of the money collected in premiums needed to be paid into actual health care. 
The other 15% is available for marketing, for administration, for executive compensation, but 85% had to go into actual cost of health care, hoping to keep premiums from rising too fast. That was in the Affordable Health Care Act. We went on to say that when it came to coverage, we detected a problem. Too many families had their sons and daughters graduating from college looking for jobs and not finding full-time jobs with health insurance. So we expanded family health care coverage to include children, young men and women, through the age of 25. We said we should be able to keep them under the family health care plan while they're getting their lives together and looking for work. That was one of the basics that was included in the Affordable Health Care Act. All of those things, I think, made health insurance, make it more affordable, and more reasonable for the families that need it. Then came the question of what to do about those people who have no health insurance. Some people don't have health insurance because they work at a job that doesn't provide it and they can't afford it. Others have an opportunity to pay for it but decide, I'm going to wait or I don't need it. You hear that particularly from younger people who think they're invincible and they'll never ever need health insurance coverage. So the question was, how do we expand the reach of health insurance coverage? And we did it in this bill. We set a standard and said, you should not have to pay anything more than 8% of your income for health insurance premiums. And if you're in lower income categories, we will help you, help you with tax credits and uh, treatment in the tax code to pay for your health insurance for your employer the business you work for will give them additional tax credits to offer health insurance, hoping to continue to expand that pool of insured people in America. And for the poorest of the poor, we said ultimately you'll be covered by Medicaid, the government health insurance plan, and for the, at least the first several years, the federal government will pay the entire cost, the expanded cost of that coverage. The notion is to get more and more people under the tent, under the umbrella of coverage. And that not only gives them peace of mind, but it also means for many hospitals and providers across America, there'll be fewer charity patients. Let's be honest about it. Even people without health insurance get sick. And when they do, they come to a hospital and they are treated. And when they can't pay, their bills are passed on to all the rest of us. My hometown of Springfield, Illinois, Memorial Medical Center, the CEO there said, if you just had everybody walking through our front door, at least paying Medicaid will be fine. Do that, Senator. And that's what this bill sets out to do. Now, there were some people who objected to the part which said, if you can afford to buy health insurance and don't, you're going to pay a penalty. Some people called it a mandate. Others, I, call it personal responsibility. If you can afford to buy health insurance, you should buy it because 60% of the folks who don't buy it end up getting sick, and the rest of us pay for it, and that's not fair to the system. It's estimated to cost those with private health insurance $1,000 a year just to pay for those who don't buy it when they can. That was one of the issues being debated before the Supreme Court. So, Madam President, this bill, which ultimately passed, was signed by President Obama, has been debated back and forth ever since. It became a major topic in this year's presidential campaign, I don't believe there was a single Republican presidential candidate who didn't stand up and say, I'll get rid of it on the first day I'm in office. Governor Romney has said that. And yet, when you look at all the provisions of protection in there, the expansion of coverage, even expanding Medicare prescription drug Part D coverage for seniors, to think that we would eliminate that, think about the hardship that would create across our country. We all waited expectantly for this day, this day at the end of the uh, October term of 2011 for the U.S. Supreme Court. And the decision today was that the Affordable Care Act that President Obama signed into law is constitutional. And now we can move forward. Some people have said, well, is it perfect? And the answer, of course, is no. I say half-jokingly, the only perfect law was carried down the side of a mountain on clay tablets by Senator Moses. All the other efforts are our best human efforts and always subject to improvement. And the same thing's true for this. I'm sure the president would say exactly the same thing. But the good news is this. Today, the Supreme Court found that the president's Affordable Care Act is constitutional. 
There was, of course, some question about one provision or another, but the bottom line is Chief Justice Roberts, not considered a liberal by any standards, led the court in a decision that found this law constitutional. And the important part of that is that it means that for a lot of families, there's going to be help through this law. In Illinois last year, 1.3 million people on Medicare and 2.4 million people with private health insurance received preventive care at no cost. That's a provision in this law that was found constitutional today. That means that mammograms, cholesterol screenings, and other efforts ahead of time for preventive care will help people prevent illness and save lives. And speaking of prevention, Mr. Pres Madam President, the law provides help for states with their prevention programs, programs to help our children stay strong with immunizations, programs that detect and prevent diabetes, heart disease, arthritis. Another reason this law is so important is because of lifetime limits, as I mentioned. Before this law, literally, insurance companies would say, sorry, you hit your limit. We can't pay for any more chemotherapy. But because of the Affordable Care Act found constitutional today by the court, 4.6 million people in my state of Illinois alone received the care they needed last year without having to worry about insurance companies' lifetime limits. It's prohibited by the Affordable Care Act. In these tough economic times, as I mentioned, when young people are looking for work, the fact that you can now have health insurance through your family plan up to the age of six is a sensible policy. Two and a half million young Americans receive protection under the Affordable Care Act because of this single provision. 102,000 of them live in my state of Illinois. Of course, the law, as I said, requires the insurance companies to spend more money of the premiums on actual medical care, 85 percent, in fact. Let in over $61 million has been rebated to those with health insurance policies uh, and 300,000 uh, people in Illinois are included in the form of a rebate because of what we term the medical loss ratio. For seniors, it's going to be a helping hand to pay for prescription drugs. They're going to be able to help fill the so-called donut hole and have less money come out of their lifetime savings to pay for the drugs they need to keep them strong and even alive. It also means preventive care for a lot of these seniors, too, to be able to get the annual checkup uh, so that they can detect some problem before it becomes serious. From the business side, the Affordable Care Act, found constitutional today by the Supreme Court, is going to help small businesses pay for health insurance. The new health care law provides a tax break for small businesses that do the right thing and buy health insurance for their employees. So far, more than 228,000 businesses across America have taken advantage of this new tax credit, and they've saved $278 million. When this is all implemented, this Affordable Care Act, 30 million more people will have health insurance across America. By 2019, 15 million of these will be in Medicaid, and the rest will be in the exchanges and in private health insurance. Let me just say another provision in here that's important was the expansion of community health care clinics. Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, a good friend and a great leader on these issues, really pushed hard for this. And I've been to these community health care clinics across my state. They are wonderful. Primary care in the neighborhoods, in the small towns, in Springfield, in Chicago, that really help people along the way. Madam President, today the President of the United States went to the um, cameras after the Supreme Court decision and talked about this decision by the court and this law. And he said, for those who believe that the Affordable Care Act was just politics as usual. It was a political risk, and he knew it. There were close friends and advisors of the president who basically counseled him, don't try to take this on. This issue has stopped president after president. I tried to help President Clinton and then First Lady Clinton when they were passing health care reform, and try as they might, they couldn't get it done. But President Obama stuck with it. Even though there was precious little help from the other side of the aisle, he stuck with it and got the bill passed. They then challenged him in court at every level they could, and today at the highest court of our land, it was found constitutional. The president said, and I think we all should pay attention to this, it's not only good in its substance, and I've described it, but it's also a new challenge for us 
Democrats and Republicans to make it work. The American people want us to come together to help make health insurance affordable and available, to incentivize quality care, and to make certain that America, the richest nation on earth, has the best and most affordable health care on earth. It took the Supreme Court 193 pages to say it today, and now it's up to us, both Democrats and Republicans, to work together. Maybe put the swords aside and sit down at a table and make this law even better across America. I think the American people are counting on us. I think the Supreme Court today, in finding President Obama's Affordable Care Act constitutional, made it clear that now it's up to us to put the policies in place that will make it successful and help families, businesses, and individuals all across America. Madam President, I yield the floor. Senator from Texas. Madam President. Madam President. Uh